And so the irony in all of this is that I think um, in a few years time, there's going to be a great opportunity for people to specialize in what I call AI content remediation. Before we jump into today's episode, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the sponsor for this episode, Ahrefs. Ahrefs provides you with an all-in-one SEO toolset that does everything from run tracking to backlink analysis, keyword research, and technical audits. The best part, you can now use Ahrefs Webmaster Tools for free to identify and prioritize optimization opportunities for your website, see all the keywords that your web pages are ranking for, take a close look at the websites that link back to and refer you in their content, and analyze other websites to find out what drives their rankings. Visit ahrefs.com awt and sign up for free. And now, back to today's episode. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the SaaS SEO So I'm your host, George Cassiotis, and today I'm very happy to be joined by Steven Jeske, a content strategy who enjoys working in B2B startups with a particular affinity for AI. His, his first experience in this domain was a music student struggling to learn Lisp. Steven, welcome to the SaaS SEO So. George, I am really excited to be here. I'm dying to talk about content strategy and so many other things. So many other things indeed. Uh, before we dive into some of these things, can you please share a few things about you and uh, you know your journey so far? Sure. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my bio there, uh, got my first introduction to AI way back, back in the actually the 80s, working with a, a language called Lisp, which is short for Lisp Processing. Um, fast forward to today, uh, I've done, you know, uh, I worked in machine automation and now I am in, seems to be the world of content automation. I've been working for uh, about a decade, I'd say, in SEO content and it's particular B2B SaaS. And so now I'm here at the market meetings where I've been for gee, almost five years. Uh, as a senior content strategist. Okay, for people who haven't heard of Market Muse before, can you please tell us a few things about uh, the tool? Who is using Market Muse and who gets the most value? Sure. Uh, Market Muse is a uh, an AI content platform, really geared towards content strategists working with a uh, like a, a team at a let's say a mid market level. You know, they're publishing a lot of content. And, and one of the major things is, is, you know, they have to have a good understanding of what content they should put out, what content is most likely to succeed, and how to build out their site with content. Okay, that, that makes sense. We will talk about AI later on. Uh, I have prepared some, some questions for you. Uh, but for now, I would like to, to start with a very basic question. How do you define content strategy? Oh, you know what? That is a really, really good question. Um, I think if I could sum it up just in one sentence, I think what I would say is that it, content strategy is really about marshalling your content team and the resources in support of specific company goals. Okay, that's <laughs> that's very specific. I didn't expect this uh, like so such a specific answer. That's that sounds good. Like. In your experience, then, what most companies get wrong when it comes to their content strategy? Well, where do I start there? Um, you know, I think the most common thing I think would be that a lot of people think that keyword research is content strategy. And it's not. Uh, you know, keyword research is a very, actually, very small part of having an, uh, an overall content strategy. It's really, uh, on the scale of things, it's actually quite insignificant, I would say, especially with the large, within a large organization. The more content you have, uh, the more problems that you have. And the problem isn't keyword research. Why do you think that happens though? I mean, why, why do companies focus so much on keyword research? Oh, George, isn't that the million dollar question? 
I wish I had the answer for that. Um, <clears throat> you know what? I, I think maybe part of that could be our fixation with search performance. That would be part of it. And, and maybe that's the number one thing is that, uh, our, you know, we're fixated on performing well in search. And quite often we're using traffic as a vanity metric. I understand. And I too think that in many cases we are kind of pushed towards like caring more about search performance and keywords and rankings and clicks and so on and so forth. I find this to be exhausting in some ways because, you know, uh, as I, as I see it, it limits creativity and like other things that we could do, but you know what, we can't do them because there's no target keyword here, but I, I understand it in, in a way because it's, I would say that, you know, some of these things that I just mentioned are easy to, to quantify, whereas it's not so easy to say that, you know what, this piece of content contributed to building a great brand. It's not so easy to measure um, that. I don't know what's, what's, what, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, it, you know, it, it is hard to attribute the success of content right, to specific goals. You can do it. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, it's, you know, you need a, a, a good, you, know, you literally need somebody that's experienced with, with data and handling that and can actually put that together for you. Whereas, you know, everybody can just look at keywords, see and see, you know, how much search traffic they're getting from that, right? That's something simple to do. It doesn't require a, a big team behind you. Uh, to collect data and analyze that and try to see, you know, especially if you're looking at, uh, you know, where people have come in through the funnel. And if you're looking at different parts of the funnel and how content is contributing to that, that's where it gets kind of crazy. It's just so much easier to just look at a keyword and say, hey, I'm getting traffic from that. I got, you know, a thousand, you know, thousand visits from that keyword. You know, I'm happy. Yeah, I, I understand. Any other things that you see companies, you know, get wrong when it comes to their content strategy? Yeah, not paying enough attention to the content they've already produced that's on their site. Because in my opinion, that's like a gold mine if you take if you know how to take advantage of it. Okay. That's where the real money is. So uh, what you're referring to essentially is auditing their content inventory? Yeah, understanding what you've already published and how to make that better and how to take advantage of that. How do you how would you say though that you can measure performance since we kind of touched on like search performance? Mm -hmm. How should companies evaluate their, their the performance of their content inventory? Meaning that you know for a piece of content, the the objective may be just you know get organic visibility and clicks. For another one, we know that this is where like conversions may happen. For another one, we produce this piece of content to kind of lead people to another piece of content or an action that's important to us. Meaning that like, what I'm trying to say is like, are there different ways to evaluate uh, content um, in different stages, you know, of the uh, life cycle uh, journey? Yeah, um, you know, and I I'm just gonna look at it from a B2B SaaS view because that's really where my experience lies. You know, uh, bottom of the funnel content is pretty easy in terms of, you know, the, the whole purpose of your bottom of the funnel content is to get some sort of a conversion. And usually if we're talking SaaS, it's either going to be a trial, right, or a freemium product offering or uh, something like that. So it's pretty simple to, to, to determine that. Um, at the top, it's pretty easy to see if you've got traffic. Right, if we're looking at top of funnel, it gets a little bit harder because you, it, ideally you don't just want, it's not just about getting traffic, it's about getting the right traffic. So you really be, want to be able to say, okay, you know, this is really good traffic in that it eventually converted, not only converted into premium uh, uh, free, but became a premium customer. You can do that sort of thing, uh, but like I was saying before, you need the right uh, types of tools 
and uh, that in itself could be like a whole, you know, a whole nother show there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. If we went down that rabbit hole. One thing I'm I'm very interested in is how a company that's just starting out with content mm -hmm. can understand how much content they need to produce and publish to build authority on a certain topic or topics that you know they are interested in. In other words, I guess my question is how can we quantify topical authority from a content creation standpoint? Is there a way to to do that? Well, um, you know, at Market Muse we do that. Um, and, and really, I think to talk about that, we should talk about a couple of things. One is, you know, your generic keyword difficulty. Um, we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about what we call personalized difficulty and, and topic authority. So at Market Views, we use personalized difficulty to measure how hard it is for you to rank. It's a scale of just like of one to 100, just like keyword difficulty. But unlike that generic term of keyword difficulty, it's really based on your content and your success in search. So in determining that, we really have to analyze your content and how well it's performed. Okay. And when you start out, you know, if you if you start with a brand new site, your personalized difficulty, that's going to be the same as your generic keyword difficulty, right? Because you have no content. You have nothing to, to, to show for it. But over time, as you build out content around a specific topic and provided that you start seeing some results in search, you'll find that your personalized difficulty improves. Essentially, that number gets lower and it gets easier. It's, you know That number is reflecting how much is, is easier for you to rank versus everybody else. Now, that difference right between your personalized uh, keyword difficulty and the generic one is really what I think of as your topic authority. And that's that competitive advantage that you've got. Okay. So like you can do it, in other words, with the help of technology, right? Yes. Yeah. And can you also do the same thing or like follow a similar approach for companies with established content inventories? that want to find gaps in their strategy. Meaning that, you know, for a new website, let's say it's, you know, it's a it's a blank canvas. Like it's it's mm -hmm. really not easy, but I mean it's obvious, let's say. Well yeah. for a for a company with let's say some hundreds or even thousands of like content pieces or pages, it may be a bit trickier. Can you can you also do that um with the help of technology? And if yes, like what have you seen work in uh, in these cases. Yeah, I, I think that would be the only way to do it. I can't imagine doing this by hand. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like, I can't imagine uh, uh, taking, you know, whatever, sc scraping your own site to get the URLs, figuring out what topic each page really ad addresses, and then sorting through that manually. Uh, I think that would just take forever and ever and ever. I'm sure people do that. It just doesn't seem to be very productive to me. Yeah, yeah, I I, yeah. I understand. I, I would like to shift gears a bit and discuss uh, helpful content. My question is, what are the characteristics of helpful content? Okay, that's interesting because, uh, you know, Jeff uh, Coyle, co-founder of Market News, and myself, we've been we've been uh, putting out a lot of material around uh, HCU over the past couple of months, looking at that. Um, and I think one of the things that's really important to to, to realize is that uh, the helpful content update is like a page level evaluation of content quality. And and when I'm talking about content quality, I'm I mean the, the context of topical coverage. How well does a page cover the topic that it's about. So that's what I'm talking about quality. I'm not talking about grammatically, although I'm, I'm sure that will factor into it or stuff like that. We're really talking about that topical coverage. Uh, and in fact, I think the other part of it too is that uh, information gain or a measurement of that might also be involved. I, I know that Google has a patent for that. I don't know if it's in production yet, but I know that they have a way of looking at a, a particular piece of content and figuring out whether or not it's just um, a generic piece. In other words, it just talks about everything else, everything that everybody else does, 
or does it add something to the conversation? Now, the key here is that it will evaluate a page, right? And it will make a determination, you know, is it helpful or is it not? But that evaluation rolls up to the site level. So if you've got too much unhelpful content, and we don't know what that limit is. You don't know if it's an absolute limit or a percentage or whatever. But in any case, if you've got too much of that, then you end up, they don't call the penalty, um, but that's essentially what it is. Uh, they apply a penalty to your entire site. Um, and it, this is all automated, by the way, right? They're, they have a classifier system and it's automated. And it uses a machine learning model. So, um, you're not going to get a manual notification of this. So it's not like a manual penalty, which is why I think they don't call the penalty. This is more, it functions like a weight essentially on, on all the content of your, on your site. And so that's a big risk for, uh, you know, um, sites that may have, let's shall we say less than good quality content on their site. It doesn't mean that they're doing it now. It could be, you know, something they've done in the past. They might've even forgotten about it. Maybe they were, I don't know, trying out to, you know, like five, six, seven years ago, spinning articles was a thing, right? Article spinners. Um, and so maybe they tried that. Maybe they did some, and maybe they published it and they forgot about it. That sort of stuff could come back to haunt them. I understand. And I mean, you, you put it nicely. As I understand it, after like hearing your your answer, con quality is sort of tied in um, helpful content. Let's say, are there any as other aspects of content quality besides just topic coverage and information gain that like people should be aware of? Well, you know what I mean. Google did publish some information, and it's general information of you know how to avoid creating unhelpful content. And, you know, it was basically the typical thing of, you know, if, if, are you just writing to get search traffic? They suggest that you don't do that. They also strongly suggest that you don't use a lot of automated content generation. Now they don't call, they didn't call it the AI content update, right? They called it the helpful content update, but the implication there is that a lot of that stuff is not helpful. And so, you know, I, I think basically they're looking, um, they're looking for, they're looking to suppress generic content. And, you know, they've also done this too with their um, product review update, right? It's just a different application because they were tired, you know, people in general were tired of just reading these reviews that were nothing other than just uh, uh, curations of existing reviews, people that are writing reviews that never, never even use the product. And so it's the same thing with uh, all other types of content. In other words, if you really don't know what you're writing about and you're not really an uh, expert or so to say, right? We all have our own domains of expertise to some extent. But if you're just constantly, you know, like one day you're writing about gardening, the next day you're writing about repairing cars, and the day after that you're writing about space, it's unlikely that you've got uh, a real expertise in, uh, you know, 12 different subjects. And so I think that's really what they're looking to discourage. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, I, I would like to discuss content briefing a bit and connect it to AI, which you, which you kind of... Uh, touched on how can you make the the case for ai powered content briefs for you know like to someone who hasn't tried a tool like market mm -hmm. news before like what's the value added here um and like what are the unique characteristics of a tool like market news as opposed to anything else when it comes to content briefing right well i mean you know there's there's two things one is you can either do this manually you know which a lot of people still do, um, or you can try to automate it in some way. And the way I look at it is AI just provides intelligent automation, I guess is the way I would look at it. Um, and it can be helpful too, because if, you're, if you were to, let's say do this manually, I think what most people generally do, 
I don't think they even get to that point. I, you know, they, they may read the first two, three articles. I don't even think they go through the top 20. Uh, but this is a typical, typically it's going to be a writer that ends up having to do this, uh, create their structure, or it'll be somebody that's creating a brief for the writing team. They're going to look at the, 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 you know, the top 20, try to figure out what are the, the main points, the main topics they should be covering, right? They're going to be trying to figure out what's not being covered, maybe a different angle, right, that they can approach, right, to make their content stand out. And they're going to have to structure that all together. They're going to have to package that somehow to, to give to the writer if it's uh, a person that's creating the brief and passing that over to the writer. So they're going to have to package that all together, tell them how, to, how it should be structured, provide a framework for what sort of topics they should cover, maybe questions, um, and then links as well. Links from... Uh, your own site, because obviously you want to make sure they've got some good links happening to your own site um, and links going out because um, it's odd not to have, it sends a weird, an odd signal to Google if you have no outgoing links, but you don't want to have links going out to your SERP competitors, right? That you're directly competing with for that article, which a lot of writers actually will end up doing if they've you know, if they've gone and just researched the, you know, if I'm, if, you know, if, if George, you tell me to write a uh, an article on how to grow tomatoes, and I don't know anything about it, and you know, this is my, you know, I I haven't been writing for very long, just a couple of months. I'm going to go and I'm going to research on Google how to grow tomatoes. I'm going to look at the top three articles. Maybe I learned something interesting, and then I get a link to them in my article, right? And you know, if, if you don't catch that as an editor because you gave me free reign, let's say, right? I can do what I want. Um, you know, then that link is just sort of like saying, hey, you know what? My competitor has a better article than I do, which really doesn't help you when you really want to rank. Um, and the other thing too is, you know, I might've just been completely off the wall, right? Without a content brief, I might have gone in a completely different direction that, you know, you didn't want me to. And then we're going to have a meeting or maybe three meetings to figure out, you know, what direction to take. Whereas a brief can solve all that. It's just time consuming to do this manually. Definitely. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Mark Muse does not use GPT-3 as part of their no. technology when generating common briefs, right? No, no, we don't. We actually, what we have is we have our own uh, topic modeling technology. It's patented. And that's what we use uh, to develop, build out our topic model. And that's really where everything comes from. Do you see, because I'm like, like you, I guess, I, we know that many tools that, you know, help you with content briefing or even content creation nowadays use mm -hmm. GPT-3 as part of, you know, their their tech. Uh, it's, it's, you know, very like close to the core of, of the technology. Do you see any future implications, you know, of using such a technology by these tools? I mean, one of the scenarios that I had in my mind was what if Google decides to to buy OpenAI one day because it makes, you know, it makes their life difficult in terms of like we have to crawl not just millions of pages, but billions of pages because people can spit out content much faster and it's better to buy open AI and, you know, sat uh, down uh, GPT-3 for everyone. That's just, you know, and a, dy a dystopian, let's say, uh, future for the generative content and AI, uh, like industry or whatever, but I would like to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? It's interesting because the uh, companies that have invested in open AI, uh, a lot of these companies are the same ones that are going through problems with a lot of fake garbage content on their sites generated courtesy of GPT-3. So it's rather ironic, I would say. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, and, and you know, this might be part of it, why? They are working on a way of watermarking GPT-3 output. 
to make it quite simple for them to, I should say relatively simple because there could be ways around it. But, you know, if it's watermarked, it'll be easy for search engines to uh, detect that this content has been generated by, uh, you know, a GPT-3. So the implication of that is, you know what, if it's easy to detect and, and uh, you know, Google doesn't, um, does, doesn't, you know, it's, it's against their terms of service to, to use automated content generation, then it's going to be real easy for them just to, you know, suppress those uh, in um, the search engine. Or, you know, going back to the helpful content update, maybe it'll be classified as unhelpful content. And then your entire site will end up suffering. So that's the danger in using that in that manner. I mean, I think there's some good uses for it. Just Can not give us some, some, example, some examples of good uses? Yeah. Um, you know, one that I, I found was interesting. I just read about this, I think, last week. Um, you know, there's there's a guy who has suffers from dyslexia. And I forget what service. He's a, he's a service provider. And so, you know, he has trouble even just, you know, sending an email saying, hey, here's your quote. And making it sound, you know, halfway intelligent. GPT three helps him with that. He had actually a friend uh, who, who, who's a programmer, you know, put that all together for him, and that was a wonderful use of it, right? Because now here's somebody who, you know, he's competent in his field. What he's not competent in is is writing uh, emails to give the quotes, which would reflect. Otherwise, it would really reflect badly on him, right? Because when you see something that's written poorly, what ends up happening? you make an assumption that that person altogether is probably going to perform poor in whatever task that you're asking them to do, which is not the case. So that's a good example of one. And the other one I can think of things like, for example, you know, low level things that don't have, um, that, that aren't necessarily that important if they don't go correctly. For example, generating alt text for images. Boring to do, need to be done. Uh, not a lot of. It's not high value. High value. It's not a high value task. It'd be perfect to farm out for something like that, and 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 there's no risk if it doesn't. You know, if, if your large language model doesn't quite get it right, it's not the end of the world. Same thing for you know generating a, a meta description of your post. Same thing there. It's, it's not a, it's not a huge risk, you know, for if it doesn't quite get it right. If they if they if they manage the water market, okay, mm -hmm. assuming that they do, don't you think that this will be kind of, I mean, if I was a brand and I was considering generative content and AI for some of you know my like content efforts, and I knew that. You know what? This is watermarked, and if, like, and generally Google doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. Of course, that would be. I, I would most likely I would steer away from from this type of content. So, do you think, or do you see in the future something like that happen? That that will have that watermark destroying the viability of long form content. Uh, not uh, not just GPT not just that, but people would like to would prefer to stay away from it because they know that you know it has a watermark and Google right. generally doesn't like it. Yeah, um, and yeah, I, I see what you mean. You're you're talking about the potential for a backlash. Yeah, essentially it. Yeah, I mean that backlash can happen on a number of levels. It can happen in. Um, from the content buyers, buyers of content essentially, who they don't want to buy GPT-3 generated content. But it can also happen on the consumers as well. And, you know, I'm honestly, I'm just waiting for lawsuits to start flying once someone says, hey, you know, I got bad advice and it was, you know, from your site and it happened to be generated by GPT-3, it's going to happen. And and what and and there's going to be a back backlash to that, guaranteed. But uh, in the meantime, have you seen any websites that? Of course, we don't have to name any of these websites. Yeah. But have you seen? I'm I'm sure that you have. But you know, like 
they use it um, and maybe at scale and it works for them. I mean, somehow they manage to um, to like go undetected, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I've heard, I've, I've, I've not seen them myself. I've heard stories. Well, I actually have seen one and this one would go back two years ago, maybe. Probably like, I, I forget when, when I forget when GPT-3 was released, but it was right around that time. And I actually knew the name of the site. I forget, I forget the name, right? <laughs> Otherwise I'd even tell you about it. And so I, I, I was curious because apparently, you know, they had put out, you know, thousand pages and, and they were getting, you know, traction in that. So I was curious to find out. Um, and it was, it's getting picked up by news outlets as well. So I was curious. So I did, a, I went and I looked into it. I, I was curious, first of all, to see, well, how's it performing, right? Is it getting a lot of traffic? What keywords is it ranking for? How about the backlinks? You know, I'm just, you know, is, is this thriving, right? Is it really a thriving, like it's led me to believe? Turned out that it wasn't in this particular case. In that particular case, the links that I was getting was just when it got picked up by news outlets as a curiosity. I wasn't getting any legitimate links from, you know, from the industry, whatever industry it was in. Um, and, and the terms that it was ranking for all over the place and, and extremely low value. So as, as a functioning site that would be economically viable, no. Interesting experiment, yeah. I understand. Uh, so uh, if, if you had to give a couple of like tips to people who think about using such tools for con creation, what would you say? Um, first of all, I would, I would say that you really have to think about the risk versus the reward. I think that's the key before you start implementing any of that. Um, the, the reward is you can generate a lot of content quickly, right? No doubt about that. I'm not too sure about whether or not you can generate it cheaply. And the reason I'm saying that is that the accuracy of, of the output leaves a lot to be desired. When you have subject matter experts look at the content that's generated, um, they're able to spot errors that, you know, other people wouldn't. And I think most people that are using it are going to be an expert in their domain. And that's the that's a big risk there. So essentially, if you want to uh, ensure that you've got accurate output, you're going to have to have a, a, a subject matter expert to verify that output. And that kind of negates any, you know, your scaling ability to generate content quickly and cheaply. Um, it's generic content that gets generated. So that kind of pegs you as being inexperienced. It's not going to generate deep insight. Well, it can't. That's not how large language models work. It's all based on uh, a probabilistic statistical model. So uh, your generic content will just peg you as being inexperienced, which is probably not something that you really want if you're thinking of using content strategically, right? You want you to have content uh, really to uh, tell your story that you're an expert. And if you're putting out generic content, what story are you telling people? Yeah, I'm average. Sure, you know, do business with me. I'm an average guy. Right? That's a good point. That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, so as as I understand it, we will keep our jobs. We will uh, keep keep <laughs> working in this industry, and there will be left, you know, things left for us to to do. Oh, definitely. I think if you use it as a as a properly as a tool, um, it can be helpful. It's certainly not going to be putting people out of business. Uh, I think the people that are using it to generate long form content will end up going out of business. Yeah, that that makes sense, and it's also I don't know. It's I like to think uh, like like that. I prefer to think like that about the future. Uh, it's let's say an, an optimistic view, and and I like it. But all these things aside, 
and I guess we will start, you know, wrapping things up now. Where do you think, um, you know, things are are heading towards? Like, where do you see all these things uh, going in? I don't know, two, three, five, ten years from from today. Um, that's a good question. If I say no. I would say it's most likely that there will be a lot of uh, content generated using GPT-3. And I'm talking about long form content because it's it's so seductive. Uh, it's very addictive to do that. And so the irony in all of this is that I think um, in a few years time, there's going to be a great opportunity for people to specialize in what I call AI content remediation. And that'll be someone to go into a site and help them figure out how to fix the mess that they've gotten themselves in from using, uh, you know, GPT-3 or any other, la you know, uh, language model um, to generate content. And, the issue that I was, you know, coming back to, you know, the helpful content update is that these sites will get penalized without knowing it, and they will be struggling, and so they're going to need help for that. And so that's kind of, you know, if 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 there's anything that will come out of it, I think there will be a specialty there for people, and it's going to be more of a content specialty. It won't really be an SEO specialty, although who knows? Maybe they'll, you know, maybe they'll phrase it that way or frame it that way but yeah that's what i see happening okay um <laughs> once again that's that's an optimistic view and and i like it um so that was all very insightful last question i have for you like with every guest here at the, at the podcast uh where can people find out more and get in touch if they'd like to yeah you know what um you can reach out to me on uh twitter at Stephen Jeske with a P-H, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, J-E-S-K-E, or on LinkedIn. I'm there as well. That's great. I hope your posts are yours and they are not <laughs> generated. <laughs> they always are. Okay, and will be. That's great. Stephen, thank you very much. Really enjoyed that. And uh, I don't know, looking forward to future discussions like this. Me too, George. It was a lot of fun. Thanks so much. Before you go, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the sponsor for this episode, Ahrefs. Ahrefs provides you with an all-in-one SEO toolset that does everything from rank tracking to backlink analysis, keyword research, and technical audits. The best part, you can now use Ahrefs Webmaster Tools for free to identify and prioritize optimization opportunities for your website, see all the keywords that your web pages are ranking for, take a close look at the websites that link back to and refer you in their content, and analyze other websites to find out what drives their rankings. Visit ahrefs.com awt and sign up for free.